Uh, hello, uh, welcome all of you again. Uh, this time the title is uh, Medical Humanities and Disability. Well, you may be wondering, we are doing a course on disability studies and why medical humanities? Well, uh, so far you may have observed there is some tension between the medical model and social model and I have indicated many times that both the models are required. But uh, we need to have a, a critical understanding of practices of medicine and even health. For that reason, uh, there is a robust field as old as disability studies. And uh, I guess it has very close linkage with disability because disability is a very important human condition. So, um, understanding medical humanities uh, with, with some attention to disability therefore is very helpful. Well, um, con there are controversies about the uh, name itself medical humanities because some say it is a very restricted term focusing on just medicine and doctors. Uh, some say health humanities will be a, a much larger and comprehensive term. We have here Dr. Shubha Ranganathan uh, from IIT Hyderabad who understands both medical humanities, medical anthropology as much as disability studies. It is quite a privilege to have her here on Skype. So, let us start straight away. Shubha, um, uh, can you tell us about yourself and then we will go on from there. I mean, um, your work in medical humanities and, and so on. Hi, Hema Chandran. Um, nice to be here again. Thank you very much, first of all, for um, inviting me to join in this conversation um, about, you know, two fields which I'm just beginning to learn about, actually. So, um, uh, Michelle Nunn has been quite generous, you know, in uh, in his introduction to me. But I am just dipping my feet, so to speak, in the waters of both disability studies and medical humanities. Um, but I do think that uh, medical humanities, as as an approach, both as an approach as well as a, as a discipline, does offer. You know, quite does have quite a lot of promise um, for looking at questions of pain, suffering, illness, disability uh, through a more um, holistic and interdisciplinary perspective. Um, so, my own my own background, my training has been in psychology, uh, and I've been working on health and mental health, uh, but I've also um, been working on health and mental health from a more anthropological perspective. So, medical anthropology would be the closest field uh, that sort of describes the kind of um, work I do. Um, so, I do think it's it's really important to have more of interdisciplinary work um, nowadays. So, bringing together, you know, psychology, literature, anthropology, sociology, cultural studies, all of these in looking at questions of health and illness and disability. So, um, and, and given that um, disability studies also is framed by the social model of disability, which, you know, looks at not, not just a biomedical approach, it's very important to have these conversations. Great, Shubha. Uh, so, uh, let, let's begin with the term medical humanities. What does it comprise, Shubha? Uh, what are its broader persuasions and how does it uh, inform many things like illness, uh, patient's experience, doctor-patient relationships and much more? How does yeah. it inform? Yeah, so I think, I mean, the origins of medical humanities actually um, it does sort of, uh, you know, historically it does go back to the field of uh, the practice of medicine, not not just you know, the disciplinary 
uh, field um, or the knowledge base of medicine, but more of you know the practice of medicine, with the recognition that um, medical education needs to also include um, uh, needs to include um, topics which are uh, which are not directly you know, from uh, from biomedicine, but which are related to engaging engaging with patients. So, for instance, uh, topics on you know communication, right? um, topics on um, representation of representation of illness or representation of the body in art, in literature, in sculpture. Um, so, medical humanities as a broad term, I think it encompasses a. Um, it brings together various disciplines, as I said, and it's really a way of understanding uh, what it means, you know, to be human. What it means, um, what it means to to deal with questions of questions of illness or or healing or or suffering. So, in that sense, uh, much of the medical humanities courses typically have their origins in medical schools. Uh, and their aim is to, you know, inculcate a sense of the the social science and the, in the practice of medicine. So to train their doctors in, you know, uh, how do you engage with people who have different belief systems regarding uh, regarding the body or regarding pain or suffering, um, as well as how do you um, to understand the different kinds of social contexts. In which you know you are um, practicing, uh, so it was more of I would say um, with the intention of um, of um, in a way humanizing and um, uh, the practice of, of medicine. But uh, medical humanities since then has has moved beyond that. Has moved beyond the medical school as well. Has moved beyond medical curriculum and medical education and. Um, yeah, but I would still say that largely many medical many medical humanities courses and programs are sort of related to um, uh, medical schools. That that seems um, more or less uh, obvious because uh, in the first place, uh, as you rightly said, it was meant to humanize medicine because. Uh, in the later half of the 20th century onwards, I think um, arrival of huge technology industry like, like MRI and uh, ever increasing uh, influence of pharmacological uh, pharmacology and pharmaceutical industries. Um, mm. uh, medicine has become more of a corporate enterprise and doctors right. increasingly uh, are trained to focus on just you know pathology of the body and not the experience of illness so that uh, right. in some sense dehumanizes the inter enterprise uh, even right. even astute students get dissuaded from uh, listening to patients when they become doctors so, in a sense, uh, I think, uh, uh, as you say, um, uh, medical humanities, uh, in some sense, bridges the gap between medicine as a, as a science and uh, uh, as an art, maybe an art that deals with human experience. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, this is being the origin, uh, medical humanities has both the sides. Uh, on uh, in itself, it can function as an independent field where uh, um, people like you and me and uh, I mean we can I can for example uh, dig into a literary archive in Indian scenario and come with its mm -hmm. own interpretations of illness, caregiving, health, suffering, and so on, mm -hmm. or one can design curricula in such a way, it helps doctor training, med, med, medical training or medical education where mm -hmm. professionalizing uh, caregiving and treating becomes fully, uh, uh, maybe becomes holistic 
you know, uh, so to speak. Uh, so, um, well, um, going from there, Shiba, um, how does it, how does it actually work in the um, medical field? Uh, let's talk about, for example, dehumanizing. Um, so, mm -hmm. how how does it humanize things? I mean, uh, we understand that uh, um, reading literature and the novel, we, we become sensitive, but one can just uh, read them and just forget, you know, I mean, how does it even help a doctor uh, in Well, I mean, I think at, at, at a very sort of, you know, at a very basic or obvious level, I would say understanding the diversity of, of human experience hmm. across, across the globe. So there are no one, there's no one way of, you know, being ill or being well. Uh, there's no one way of defining even what is illness and, and what is health. So I think even the recognition of that heterogeneity and that diversity is um, is something which you know would be would be important. So for instance, if you're if you're looking at something like um, um, like when you know um, when do people go to go to a doctor or go to a, a clinic for a you know, um, for reporting a symptom. When if you're looking at health-seeking behaviors, mm. you're looking at people ac accessing health services, mm. uh, people would engage in health-seeking behavior if they see themselves as having a problem, or if you know they label something as an as a as a problem and potentially an illness. Uh, but again, how uh, in in some contexts. Uh, people might might not even see, for instance, let's take something like pain, mm. right? Which, which is such a um, you know such a inchoate kind of experience, mm. um, very vague, uh, very difficult to define, very subjective, mm. and not medical, right? It's it's the one you know physical symptom or or physical category really, which. Uh, can only be identified. There is no known diagnostic test for it. Can only be identified by uh, the report, a subjective oh, report of, patients. of a patient. Correct. Yes, mm. and of course, you know, pain varies. Um, in some contexts, you know, people might might uh, see pain as as a normal part of everyday living. Correct. And some. Um, context people would not report it so for instance um, I have a student who is working on pain and um, she uh, she's working on chronic pain and she went to a government um, uh, you know, a doctor in a government hospital recently mm. and she described her project you know to him uh, and he said you won't find you know you won't find those kinds of patients here people don't come here for chronic pain they just take, you know, whatever over-the-counter medication they can get their hands on, and they sort of get on with their lives. I mean, they don't, um, they don't necessarily, you know, label a problem as chronic pain or even see that as something, uh, you know, to get uh, uh, to access help for. But you change the class, you move to, you know, an you know, an upper class spectrum or a middle class spectrum. You move to. Um, a middle caste or you know upper caste you move to a different social demographic and you know you you see you see a lot of you know pain clinics and pain centers and ayurvedic treatments for pain and all kinds of uh, service providers so so i think um, medical humanities at at a very um, at a very practical level is about you know giving the knowledge um, uh, to doctors, and a lot of this knowledge comes from medical anthropology about the diversity of human experience. And then I would say another very practical kind of application is in about is about communication. Communication really about language. Yes. Oh, okay. Can you explain yeah, more? So doctors yeah. Communication. Yeah. For example, communicating pain. Uh, is it a tingling pain or a? Um, Stabbing pain. Um, yes. 
or a, or a deep pain, you know, there are lots of hundred varieties of pain. Yeah, I mean, so not only in terms of the kind of words which are used, but even for instance, in terms of um, how much to talk. So, so like in the Indian context, you know, um, the field of medicine is also very hierarchical. Mm. So it's very clear, you know, the status of a doctor is different from a status of a patient. It's very clear who directs the conversation. It's very mm. clear that patients respond, patients answer. Mm. They do. They don't direct the conversation. They do not. Um, they do not steer the conversation in specific ways. Mm. And that, if patients are not asked the question, they may not report. Or if patients think that they are expected to say, um, say yes that that's what good patient behavior is, they might do so. So I think even understanding, you know, the sort of um, um, the, the psyche of, you know, the specific patient pool that one is working with mm. and then learning how to communicate. Mm. So in some sense, uh, first it's, uh, uh, it can, medical humanities can aid uh, cultural competence and also um, uh, empathy and bringing empathy and communication uh, role together uh, in medicine training. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for its own sake, how does it work, uh, Shubha? Um, generating knowledge. Uh, for example, your, your patient, sorry, your student went to um, government hospital. But what if mm -hmm. your student digs up folk, um, uh, folk narratives and come up with right. explanations on illness and uh, grandma's medicine and so on. What, what does it do to medical humanities? It changes the idea of what is medicine also. You know, it changes the idea of what is, what is healing. That healing also is not necessarily you know, the biomedicine dominated kind of healing, which we understand healing is not just the sort of, you know, uh, the absence of cure. I mean, this was um, in one of the papers I have written. I'm going to come uh, to that soon. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I brought it up because uh, even the notion of cure is something which, um, um, which has usually been defined from a very biomedical frame, mm. right? But healing, healing may not necessarily overlap with cure. I mean, it may extend, it, it may be beyond that. Mm. So I think in terms of, um, uh, so there are contexts in which patients don't just want to get treated, they want to feel wholesome. Mm. So that, and then you have the whole wellness movement, which is, which is really about propagating that. Right? Not about being well, not just about being well and not being sick, but about having a having a full and complete sort of life. About being, you know, being better than well. Um, and then there are some there are some contexts when, for patients, it's not just about whether they get well or not, but about the process. You know, the path to healing. They don't want that path to be an unpleasant or a, a painful or a troublesome one. Process yep. of of treatment and healing to be something which involves them, or which um, um, you know, where they they understand what is what is going on. I mean, it can go the other way as well. There may be some patients who don't want to know anything about their disease; they just want to, you know, get rid of it. But I think so. So it's so you know, even to impart the idea to doctors that there is not necessarily one perfect way of doing things as a doctor. I think that is something which is really important. That there is no black and white. Most definitely because existential questions don't have yes and no answer. They cannot mm -hmm. uh, fit into objective type um, answers or nor they can be uh, narrated in five minutes of patient doctor interview. Um, it looms large, you know, uh, and um, uh, 
tra imparting that knowledge to both the patients and doctors and, and the health system at large uh, is an important task that we all have for now uh, and hence the relevance of uh, uh, medical humanities as a field, I guess. But uh, bringing this disability component, how does it work, Shubha? Um, because, uh, see, on the one hand, um, we have uh, um, feminist scholars uh, usually talking about caregiving uh, in the mm -hmm. private sphere. There are those who talk about um, access to health as human rights um, mm -hmm. um, for people with, with and without disability. There are um, mm -hmm. um, others who get into phenomenon phenomenology of illness and disabilities and together also. Like uh, uh, Carol Thomas who talk about impairment effects. I mean, she said uh, in the social model, don't uh, delete the challenges the impairment poses because it is real. It is very, very, very real. So, yeah. So now, where do we uh, fit this whole different kinds of um, labels? To, we'll talk about labels, then real situations. Like, uh, you, you did mention about pain. You did mention about suffering. I would add illness and disability. Then, how, where, where will it go? How does it go? Yes, so, in, you know, when it comes to disability, I think the social sciences, their contribution to disability studies has, is also very central. Mm. Um, recognizing that what is really needed in in the understanding of issues of disability is a social science perspective mm. um, and I mean here so in the social sciences the you know there is a the material discursive perspective mm. which is you know really about arguing that there is a the, there is a material context mm. to social phenomena mm. uh, at the same time there is also you know um, there's also a discursive context. So, mm. taking a very extreme radical constructivist position that all kinds of, you know, um, all kinds of experiences or all the categories are uh, are socially constructed or are, um, um, sometimes can can be equally damaging mm. even while be enabling because it, it may not necessarily, um, you know, recognize a very real material context in which people are living. So you think of, you know, I mean, caste is one very good example for that. Right? Which one? Caste Which? Or yeah, caste. Poverty. Yeah, correct. For instance. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's all very well to, to sort of argue that, you know, well, and, and one could, from a radical constructivist or, you know, argue that um, caste and poverty are all at the level of discourse, at the level of language, and they are, um, you know, they are constructions of the mind, but that that doesn't recognize the, the very real conditions of living that people are are housed in. Uh, so the material discursive perspective in the social sciences bridges, you know, both. Mm. And uh, and that is that is something like that is important even even in fields like disability studies, um, or like for instance in fields which I work in in mental health, mm. you know, as well, uh, where you have a similar sort of situation. Of you know uh, some uh, extreme uh, an extreme position that there is absolutely no such no such category as as mental illness and or the idea that mental illness is you know is a is a myth or it's just a um, a construction or it's just a a means of social control and while there is an element of truth to it I would say to over generalize it would be to sort of negate or deny the kind of suffering that 
um, people you know go through and and ultimately i think so from disability study uh, the own learning uh, uh, for me like which especially the field of social uh, the area of psychosocial disabilities and mental health has taken it is to recognize you know the voice of the um, the voice of the person and and how how people choose to identify themselves so one one person might choose to identify themselves as a you know as disabled someone might might not choose to you know use that label one person may choose to um identify or, or to um uh, you know oneself as having an impairment so in a very medical sense but um for me i think what is important is to sort of allow a plurality of different um different options or different approaches great so um see doctors now let, let me talk about doctors dilemma now see one on the one hand doctors know a lot a lot uh, about human body um uh, mm-hmm. and they have uh, a box of labels uh, maybe a big box of labels connected to the bodily functions and non functions and on top of that they have uh, a commitment for their professionalism uh, maybe do no mm. harm something like hippocratic oath so uh, i'm here to treat uh, my patient and the person right. who is sitting in front of me is my patient so uh, i i myself uh, um have experienced this uh, I, uh, once i enter the doctor knows uh, that i am visually impaired and uh, um if i go with a eye pain then it is all about uh, um instead of focusing on the pain the focus mm. for next half an hour will be about uh, focus on curing my blindness and uh, even if i insist no it can't be uh, doctors somehow because of the commitment for their work and uh, uh, a commitment for curing uh mm. then the his or her um sympathetic attention a real genuine attention will be about curing so uh yeah. given this uh, but a person who who is hardened in uh, disability rights would uh, see mm-hmm. that as a um i would call it even insult uh but mm. uh, but somebody who who is as much committed who who can understand doctor's predicament may be more understanding so i am just giving a real life uh, conversation yes. in a doctor's uh, consulting room you yes. know absolutely absolutely so, i mean how the one of doctors choose to define the problem mm. may not necessarily be in sync with how patients choose to you know define the problem i mean in in the field of mental health this happens all the time mm-hmm. when you know then let's say if a person who is diagnosed with schizophrenia complains of some some kind of you know physical physical pain or physical symptom a psychiatrist might be very quick to assume that this pain is also somehow psychogenic in origin or you know the the label of of schizophrenia or mental illness sort of over defines the patient for them just as you know in your case the label of disability over defines you know your identity um so so i think um even learning to listen there you know doctor patient communication is not just about about doctors talking and speaking but about really learning to listen and i think that is something very important it seems like a um um very difficult task i mean uh, in some sense we expect from doctor doctors 
uh, which is not actually practiced by other professionals. Uh, so, uh, I, I do not find uh, in my own, in our own professions, uh, teachers not necessarily uh, teach from a student's point of view. Um, uh, there are aggressive, there are aggressive PhD supervisors um, uh, yeah. and, and uh, just who talk about rules and not the person. Uh, right. how, how are we going to really, this seems like more like an ideal rather than a uh, doable situation. Is, is that a fair description, Shubha? Um, are we placing too much of a burden on on doctors? Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe I said I, that. I, maybe I said that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, that's how I, I read it, at least. Yes, yes. Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, I do agree with you that this is some empathy, you know, the, the qualities that we're talking about, qualities mm. of listening, qualities mm. of empathy, mm. you know, qualities of um, of, of care, mm. right? I mean, the, you know, these are required in, um, in a variety of other service uh, professions uh, also, and increasingly, you know, the best... I would say the best service professionals are those who are able to um, imbibe and these qualities. Those, those qualities. Yes. Uh, so I don't think it is an unfair burden on you know doctors. I mean the response would be as to you know why 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 should doctors be exempt from that? Definitely. You know why? Should, um, I think also it's about in. Um, Medicine, in at least as practiced the traditional way, has very set ideas about what is a success and what is a failure. Mm. Uh, successes and what are the failures of medicine. Mm. Um, so someone refusing, you know, treatment for a, con a condition that they could possibly cure, mm. you know, might be seen as a as a case of failure. For a doctor, I mean, if the person chooses to do it for for certain for whatever reason, you know, either religious belief or you know cultural beliefs or um, or practical reasons, whatever, it might be seen as a case of you know failure in medicine. Mm. Um, even when you know, as social scientists, we know that you know treatment and cure is not the only or even Goal. perhaps the most important thing. So, mm. so. It's really about bringing the shift, changing, shifting the language from cure to care, while recognizing that care itself cannot be defined in a singular way. Great. Um, the uh, humanities, medical humanities, are in that context, care context, talking about something like narrative medicine. What is yes. that, Shubha? What is what is narrative medicine? Um, so I mean, na narrative. The narrative perspective is all about the power of language, isn't oh, it? Okay. And and about stories. It's about how we understand our lives as um, as storied constructions. So we we live we live out stories mm. in our. You know, lives, which means that you know there there are um, characters, there is a plot, there is some idea of you know what kind of ending might it might be there. There's a sense of action and movement. Mm. You know, stories are about things happening, things mm. happening to people. Mm. Stories are not just descriptions; they're not like factual descriptions of you know what is tuberculosis, but it's about someone having having tuberculosis and how it affected. Um, his or her uh, life and what they did and what happened to them. So stories are really about that. And, um, yeah, I think in in, in medicine, um, it, it is even more important. It's, it's, yes, absolutely. You know, we talk of about illness narratives. Correct. That especially when when people are uh, are affected by some some serious kind of. Uh, disturbance or disruption in their in their normal life story, there is a tendency to then you know, ask the question, why me? And there's a tendency to, to weave a story 
around that, which is your illness narrative. I could recall this uh, nice uh, autobiography, Shubha, uh, Dr. Paul Kalanidhi's uh, uh, When Breath Becomes Air. Um, he mm. was diagnosed with stage 4 uh, cancer and he mm. was a leading neurosurgeon and he had only mm. a year to live and that triggered him to write that remarkable self-reflective um, hmm. I mean, uh, he wrote to live. Uh, he wrote so that he he dis he can discover his uh, meanings uh, in the final stage of his life. I mean, existential drive to write. Uh, that that's what prompted him to write such a, a very nice autobiography. Hmm. So so what you. Uh, said now about narrative medicine, we are storied reality and we are all made up of feelings and these feelings mm. cannot be just generated or captured by statistical analysis or blood chemistry, blood report. Uh, we tell ourselves and caregivers tell us something and you, you, you only need to visit a patient who has recovered and just still uh, listen to him or her, her and that immediate caregivers, how they recall the battles mm -hmm. lost and won, you know. Um, it's all yes. about their uh, uh, spirit to, uh, of resilience and much more, you know. Uh, well, Shubha, that, that um, makes me slowly move to your work in uh, medical humanities. Um, I would say uh, it's a very fine work of cultural psychiatry. Um, um, well, I'm defining it that way. I'm sure you define it much more in a nuanced way uh, because um, even 10 minutes ago, you said uh, mental illness, for example, cannot be uh, defined just by a label. It is because it is also an experience. It is also a spiritual, uh, it also connects with one's spiritual uh, universe, uh, one's mm. well being, uh, one's past, one's future. One would only have to listen to uh, Reshma's, uh, Reshma Valiapan's interview uh, a couple of weeks ago in, in our course. Um, the way she defined her condition, uh, schizophrenia, it's, it's, never, it's not there in any book of um, that uh, is defines schizophrenia, you know. Uh, uh, for her, it is all about... Um, her commitment to multiple urges, sensations, voices and commitments that come from inside. Uh, that kind mm -hmm. of uh, definition I never, that kind of definition I never heard anywhere. Yeah, because it's a first person narrative. So, Karen. in the field of mental, I'm, I'm cutting in here. You know, sure, sure. So go on, go on. That's running in my head where I lose it. But uh, like in the field of, you know, even the... The mental illness, mm. uh, the expert perspective has a certain definition about what is schizophrenia. But of course, the experts are not schizophrenic <laughs> until now. And it's only with, until now, mm. where now with the user survivor movement and, uh, you know, people like Reshma arguing uh, that we are also experts by experience, you know. Mm. Given that, you know, the doctors, the psychiatrists, the clinical psychologists, they don't know what it feels like to to see visions or to hear voices or to, you know, have compulsive, you know, urges, for instance. But but people who experience a condition do know. I mean, they know some of it. And 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 that kind of knowledge is is equally valid, if not more. It's equally important, if not more. That is what the experts, you know, by experience perspective really argue. So uh, so do we need a user survival movement in in the field of medicine broadly in India, I think so. 
you know i think for too long patients are not patients are not seen as as consumers they're not seen as you know people who who are using and accessing a service and so so consider, the consider what are they seen as rights what are they seen as shubha instead recipients i think they're seen as recipients okay uh in a sense hmm you know the so not not as not necessarily as having rights mm. but getting benefits mm. they seem seen as recipients who are you know getting benefits either from the state or or from the system you know even if it is private practice right mm. there is no concept of patients patient rights right i mean it's, it's almost um, uh you may to feel as if you're you're obliged to the medical system for getting the services you you require even mm. if you are in private practice and you know you're willing to pay and all of that you still have to wait in a waiting room for a long time you still have to uh you are still told you know what you need to be what you need to be doing or how you should be um, doing it i i i don't think you're taken on board your perspective is not taken on board yeah okay um uh, tell me about your uh, tell us about your work with uh, um on field shubha um mahanubhav uh, um sect and you have got done you've written good many amount of articles on field work uh, you you went to those temple lived there participant observation um and uh, uh yeah maybe you can begin there maybe i can chip in whenever i need some clarification <laughs> yeah so um so my work began with an interest in looking at extreme states and uh, i was looking at women's experiences of trance and possession um in healing healing temples and healing shrines um so i was looking at you know women who went to different kinds of um, healing sites because they they had some kind of difficulty which they attributed to uh, a, a case of possession or black magic and uh, or mm. a case of you know being being possessed by ghosts being a victim of black magic and they went to temples or uh sites which are seen as having a power to you know to uh to heal these kinds of cases mm. uh, and um, part of the healing process in in the temple also involves going into a trance mm. um i i have done field work to try and understand the narratives around around possession around illness around healing mm uh context um and um i think it has very important implications for even telling us you know as to what do people define as you know uh, when do people label a problem as a problem when do we so how how do people define what is illness and um uh what what is important what do people look for when they look for for healing mm. uh so what i found is that for for many of the women that it's it's also about accessing a space which is um um you know which is which is very accepting which uh which gives them a kind of freedom and a space which they otherwise cannot necessarily access in their everyday lives which mm. you know breaks them from the mundane and the monotonous you know routine of their everyday uh responsibilities mm. and is them a space to just to just be um and it also builds builds a community you know with um a community a network of fellow sufferers so to speak mm. uh, in ways which otherwise are not necessarily directly accessible uh um to people so um 
so pilgrimages i mean you know staying in healing shrines um they they offer um a, a range of opportunities for women in certain contexts mm. um to sort of you know broaden their um yeah, broaden their experience broaden their you know, life what about uh, i i get this point about um their uh, seeking um say get into possession uh and they seek temple rituals um uh, mm-hmm. uh you sudhir kakar uh, and many have um, detailed documentation uh, about um um such states of mind and spiritual experience but uh, modern medicine would dismiss it this in one statement as or one word as superstition so unscientific yeah uh, uh, on scientific base uh, or uh, even rationalist um our own humanities people uh, many may also see it as a um um uh, a source of exploitation uh, of poor people mm. so how do you deal with such contradictions when working on such things uh, for yourself as a academic and working from the field of medical humanities so uh, uh, was that a clear question shubha yeah yeah so i think yes i mean I, i i understand the question okay i think you know that kind of dismissal of these kinds of local healing practices as mm. as superstition or as unscientific or irrational mm. comes from the notion that there is one way to do science and there is you know, one kind of science which is or should be you know universal uh but when you come from you know when you come from the perspective of uh, anthropology medical anthropology it start from the presumption that you know there is there is not necessarily one way you know to be um to be human or to you know experience humanity then you you know you you do not categorize behaviors or practices as either rational or irrational or as either scientific or uh superstitious but you know you look at them as as practices you look at them as beliefs hmm. and um so in my own work whenever you know this question um did uh, come up and i you know i had to address it uh even at a, at a personal level uh the only way i found to do that was to was to understand that this is you know asking the question of you know whether people are really possessed or not mm. whether people are really in a real trance or in a fake trance you know whether whether it's a case of faking or it's a genuine case that asking the question of you know which one is it that is not the right right question mm. right from from the vantage point of from the perspective of the individual mm. right how they define their reality so when you recognize that there are multiple realities and if you live in a universe where you know there are ghosts there are jinn there are people who use black magic there mm. are things like that. if that is something which is conceivable in your in your universe mm. it's very possible for you you know to to define yourself as as possessed and to you know go into a um trance whereas if you if you live if you live in a like in a in a disenchanted world <laughs> like seeing body as a just a machine you know uh, uh made up of parts yeah yeah i mean it's it's like you know the place of you know religion hmm right no i'm to- talking you know, about disenchanted world uh, yeah. outlook yeah think the same kinds of uh, you know difficulty these the same kinds of issues which came up with your enlightenment that's right right when you know religion suddenly had a very different kind of status from from its previous pedestal kind yeah, of position correct, because correct correct 
Yeah, so if, if you live in that kind of, you know, rational, disenchanted universe, then you are not going to go into a you know, trance. You're going to see things as 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 very unreal. And and that is your reality. And I, I'm appreciative of that kind of reality as well. I don't necessarily like to even use terms like spiritual or spiritual healing or, you know, because it almost seems to sort of, you know, glorify a certain kind of, you know, reality. I don't necessarily... So I, um, rather than um, thinking of spiritual experience as something which is, you know, necessarily or a higher level or plane for uh, their non-spiritual experience. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not necessarily sure that you know that is also true because the reason I say this is because now in the field of health itself, you know, you have this additional dimension of spirituality and like health. Uh, you know, the, the WHO definition of health. It's not just physical or mental, but also you know, spiritual health, which um, I think may, again, not necessarily hold true for for everyone, right? Um, yeah, so, um, so, so, so I think my, my own work sort of pushed me to to sort of be very deeply appreciative of the different kinds of realities that people are inhabiting. And the, the, the problem often is that um, when there is cross talk Correct. between doctors and patients or between um, um, survivors and service providers, so that is, I think, where, um, where medical humanities can Coming. So, uh, I mean, introducing medicine and health services to contexts of healing, experiences of healing, I mean, differential experiences of healing, and formative um, concerns con concerning caregiving, care receiving, mm. uh, all that seems to be. Um, uh, may, will can certainly make medicine wholesome. Uh, it seems mm. that's the goal of medical humanities, and that is where uh, uh, disability studies can scholarship can also benefit and offer because um, it, it can see disability. Disability studies certainly sees disability more than a um, broken. Uh, 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 disability is more than a broken body and broken mind. So uh, similarly, this wholesomeness um, can mm -hmm. add. But you add a very important dimension. Uh, you while working on this uh, many healing traditions, you don't necessarily privilege one over the other. You merely aim for democratizing um, the um, validating many kinds of human experiences and that can feed into um, health services including doctor training. Uh, um, right. Yeah, C can we put it that way, uh, Shubha? Yeah, I think, very, I think that's a very good way of putting it. You know what, we are just um, nailing one hour there. <laughs> Karthik really okay. alerted me. Very nice uh, talking to you, Shubha. Um, hope listeners uh, will really like it. Thank you so much for coming on Skype. Thank you, Emma Chandran. It's a pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye.